Amen. We are going to go back to Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, a little bit of an announcement. I've already told the folks online, some of you don't know, the men we talked about it yesterday that went out to uh, street preach. Uh, I, I tell you what, instead of going, yeah, yeah, let's go to Hebrews. Um, but we talked about yesterday, um, because there's so many folks that are now involved with us through Skype and so on. Um, and then we got new folks coming in, um, a lot of visitors. We thought it would be good in the Sunday afternoons to uh, go back to teaching and suspend our prayer time. Of course, we knew that would be temporary anyway. Um, but today we're going to do that. We're going to start with the very basics, the fundamentals of the kingdom, starting from the book of Genesis of what the kingdom of heaven is. And once once you know that, you'll have no trouble with knowing what the church is. Amen. And understanding eternal salvation, understanding when the parables say you can lose your salvation, it's talking about the parables of the kingdom. It's not talking about heaven or hell. It's talking about the kingdom. So we need to know what the kingdom is. Amen. So we're going to do that. And I plan, I'll, I'll make some notes on my board and We'll try to set it up where the folks on uh, Skype for business can see it. But anyway, I'm, uh, where am I? I'm in the wrong place. That's where I'm at. I'm still over in 2 Peter, 1 Peter. Hebrews chapter 5. It says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, but that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sins. Okay, um, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about the difference between Aaron and Jesus Christ last week and that Aaron had to be chosen. He had to be chosen of men, but Christ was chosen of God before the foundation of the world, and we found that he is the only one that can be our priest in the, in the sense that our sins can be re removed and our consciences can be made clear. Amen? Aaron can never do that because every year he had to offer up those same animals, didn't he? All the time. Okay? Well, we looked at that and talked about him offering for the sins of the ignorant. And we went back to, uh, I believe it was Numbers 15. Yes, it was. And we looked at how they handled different kinds of sins in the old tabernacle camp. And we found that they correlate to New Testament doctrine on how to handle sins in church, uh, church discipline, and so on. And very practical. If the book of Hebrews is not practical, if all it is is just a, a reference, uh, but, it, but it doesn't practically apply, apply to your life, then chances are um, we're, we're misreading it or we're reading it too fast. Um, but there's another thing in here. Notice what it says in verse um, 4 and 5. It says, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Aaron was called of God. Now, don't we hear that a lot these days? I'm called. Of course, the psychology world has just uh, jumped on that like a barnacle and said, What is your calling? And, and, and it means absolutely nothing uh, because, I mean, really, you, you take some person, what's your calling, and, you're not, and they'll say, well, I'm looking for my calling, or my calling is to be a painter, or my calling is to be a politician. My question is, who called you to do that? No, it's what you want to do, in other words. That, that we have so misused that word. Well, even in, in churches, we misuse the word. Someone says, I'm called. And we just let it go. I mean, how many women today are saying they are called into the ministry? I can't let that go because they're not. I don't care how emotionally hyped they are about preaching. They are not called to the ministry. Okay, now let me also tell you this. There are many men today that say, I'm called. And if you're in the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, a lot of times, and I, I'm not here to really bust on anybody, but a lot of times that, that is not in any way um, checked out. And they, they say, oh, praise the Lord, you need to go to Bible college. And then they send you to Bible college. And then if the Bible college don't keep you and they actually send you back, uh, then maybe 
they'll try to use you. And if you're not qualified, but you're called, see, they think that, that you can be called without being qualified. Uh, if that's the case, then they'll try to find a ministry for you. Uh, boy, are we in trouble with God on that. Amen. So I want to talk today about the call to preach. And uh, it means we're going to jump to another text, but I, I didn't want to go past this without talking about the call to to preach. If we could go to Ephesians now in chapter 4, we'll look at uh, beginning of verse 1. He says, Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. There's a vocation wherewith men are called. Called, he says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. That sounds the same way as the Lord Jesus, who did not glorify himself in his calling, neither did Aaron. Amen. But God got the glory. He goes, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body. And one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now when it comes to the call to the ministry, there's only one ministry. Well, I have a music ministry. Find that in the scriptures for me real quick and then I'll agree with you. Can't find it. Uh, well, you know, I, I have a children's ministry. Find that in the scriptures and I'll agree with you. Well, I'm the associate pastor. Find that one in scriptures and I'll eat your ass. It's not there, is it? Well, I was, I'm an evangelist that goes around and uh, teaches people uh, and edifies the body of Christ. Well, that sounds really good. But show me in the scriptures someone that does, show me an itinerant speaker in the scriptures. Show me that ministry. Because what we're doing today is we're saying, oh, you're not qualified to pastor a church because you've been divorced, remarried, or for whatever reason. But you can be an evangelist. Or how about this one? Missionary. Find that, even find that word in the Bible. Find a reference to what that means in the Bible. You won't, but if you pull up the old Jesuit order, you'll find what a missionary is. Amen. Um, what I'm trying to say is we, we have so used this idea of calling and we have trampled it. We have watered it down. And now we have plenty of men that are uncalled, unsent, and they're doing more damage to the, uh, to the world and to the church of God than they would ever do by following the scriptures. Amen. So I'm going to talk about this call to preach. Now, let's go on. He says, verse 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. You know, here in the body, when you're baptized in this body, God's going to give you a gift, or gifts, actually, and to use them for this body and its mission. Amen? Anyways, he says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So when the Holy Spirit came on the church of Pentecost was the day that gifts were being brought unto men. And it's still that way through the church because the Holy Spirit didn't baptize the world. He baptized the church. Isn't that correct? Amen. Anyway, he says, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Now look what he look at the gifts they're talking about here. Look at the context of Ephesians 4. This isn't talking about every believer. This is talking about preachers. Okay, and there's four kinds of preachers that you see in the New Testament. The first one it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, when we look at apostles, we know that they no longer exist. 
that age is gone. There's no more signs to the Jews, no more miracles needed. Amen? They're gone. All the authority and all the authoritative writings of the apostles are now contained in the scriptures that are before us. Amen? So we know today there's no such thing as an apostle. But it was a legitimate ministry of the New Testament. Amen? Well, look at the second one, likewise. Prophets. I can't tell you how many Baptist preachers I've heard say that it's talking about Ezekiel and Daniel and Samuel and Elijah, Old Testament prophets. No, this is still a New Testament ministry here. What would he be talking about? Did anybody ever read the Gospels, all four of them that mentioned the 70 prophets that were sent out? And they had power to tread on serpents and snakes, and they could raise the dead and heal the sick and cast out demons. Amen. Anybody remember that? Well, that's what he's talking about here. In matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, the chapter that tells us about church gifts, it says he had set some uh, in his church first apostles, secondarily prophets. Well, there it is, amen. First, Samuel was not a prophet in the New Testament church. He was dead thousands of years before the New Testament church ever started. Amen. So he's talking about apostles and prophets. So both of these, don't we know that both of these have expired? Even Paul himself, he said, whether there be prophecies, whether there be tongues, Amen. In other words, all the apostolic and, and prophecy gifts were waning. Uh, why? Because the completion of the Word of God. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part is done away. Anyway, that leaves us now with basically two ministries. He says evangelist, semicolon. Notice these, uh, do y'all believe every little jot and tittle? I do, I do. He says, and he gave some apostles, semicolon. And some prophets, semicolon, and some evangelists, semicolon, and some pastors and teachers. Where's the semicolon between pastors and teachers? It's not there, is it? That's the same office, same thing. That's why we ordained Marty to be a teacher in this assembly, because that's a pastor is a teacher. Amen? So what that does is it, it brings us down to two ministries, evangelists and pastors. Now, who, I'll, I'll just test your knowledge a little bit, and uh, it comes out of 2 Timothy, who was charged to do the work of an evangelist? The only scriptural record that tells someone to do the work of an evangelist, who is the Apostle Paul telling to do that? Timothy, Timothy okay. Who is Timothy? Pastor of the church. So, where is this itinerant speaker mess? Where is this whole idea of I just go around in my bus and my family and we homeschool and we, we preach at churches and we take everybody's offerings and we move on to the next thing? Where is that in the Bible? It's not there. Amen, it's not there. As a matter of fact, all that is is just a holdover from the old Protestant Charles, uh, John Wesley. Amen, that comes from John Wesley. All right. Um, now, why did God give us Pastors, teachers, evangelists. And by the way, evangelists, well, yesterday we were doing the work of an evangelist. We were out preaching the gospel, trying to gather people, trying to get saved people together. When we sent Brother Marty and Brother Bill, uh, Brother Bill was not ordained, but that family went with them just by proximity of where they live. Brother Marty was is trying to gather people. Amen. Uh, he tried to do that here, preaching, street preaching, and so on. And in now he is ordained the pastor of that church. But he'll continue to do the work of an evangelist. Amen? Just like we will do. I don't see this missionary or evangelist anywhere in Scripture. What I see is preachers being sent out as evangelists to preach the Word of God. And if they get saved, you baptize them and a church forms. If they don't get saved, you go to the next town. This whole idea of the fundamentalist saying, we need a church in every town. Okay, maybe you need a church in every town, but God didn't say that. Matter of fact, Paul, his first missionary journey, quote, went out to ten cities. Anybody recall how many churches started? Three. 
So you write that into the sword of the Lord and they would never print that because you're an abject failure. Right? I think we're confused on what the ministry is. Okay? It's one ministry. Now watch. <clears throat> and he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Who's, who's that? That's y'all. That's us. That's right. For the work of every ministry. No, I didn't say that, did it? For the work of a ministry. No, no, it says for the work of the ministry. You say, well, where's the ministry? You're sitting in it right now. You got your Bible open, you're being taught by an ordained pastor. That's the ministry. Anyway, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, <clears throat> I believe the call to preach today has become something that's uh, mystical, something that's intangible. And um, when, when, it, when it's done, when a person says they're called and they do all the things that they are told to do now, such as go to Bible college and, and all that stuff, I, I think the calling is, is so uh, perverted in that people today feel or are taught that they are above those who are not called. Uh, you ever get that sense? That there's a gulf divided between <clears throat> the lay people and the clergy. I mean, preachers preach this all the time. Uh, that is called a Nicolaitan spirit, which Christ tells us twice in the book of Revelation, which thing I hate. Amen? I want to tell you, when you're called, it's never to be above somebody else. It is always to serve somebody else. I'm just going to tell you. Amen? We're going to prove it here in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of preachers get called someplace else when things get going tough. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, they can preach to you about giving and all this stuff and make it hurt and give to God and grace and all these things but when things get hard when there's failure and I'm going to tell you in the ministry you will face 99% failure you hear me 99% of what you do with people will end in failure because they rather have darkness than light amen that's even church people but they just tend to move. I'm called somewhere else. I like the guy that says, well, I'm called to Bible college. I've heard people say that. I said, why are you going to Bible college? Well, God called me to Bible college. No, he didn't. You're going to your pastor's alma mater. See, so he can say, look, guys, I'm sending you, I'm feeding that college. Put me off in the sword of the Lord. Let me speak at the nat national conference. That's what it all comes down to. Anyway, I was called to a mission field. Hmm. And today I've noticed, these days anyway, it didn't used to be, but qualifications are completely overlooked at the first stage of the calling. When someone says, I'm called, they don't go to the qualifications and say, well, you can't be. Oh, yes, I am. I know I'm called. Don't tell me I'm not called. Well, wait a minute. If you're not qualified, according to 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, you're not called. I mean, mark it down. See, if we say we're called, but, <clears throat> and, but I'm disqualified, that's confusion. Now, do I believe a called man can disqualify himself? Absolutely. But for somebody to say, I'm called, and they're already disqualified. That's confusion. Amen. Uh, I want to deal specifically today with the call. I, I'm not going to deal with laying hands and training and sending out so much. I'm going to deal with the call. How can a person know they are called to preach? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's the same with every calling in Scripture. Do you know there's more callings than preaching? There's call to service. There's call to separation. There's call to holiness. There's call to salvation. There's, there's a lot of calls. 
But every one of them have the same three things in common. For instance, um, let's just talk about the call of salvation. Okay, we'll just use it first. The call of salvation starts with an appointment. It starts with an appointment. You know, today, if you're not saved, and you're sitting here under the preaching of the gospel, it has been appointed. You didn't accidentally happen into hearing the gospel. It's been appointed. Amen? Uh, it's easy to see the call to salvation in the Bible. Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come! And let him that heareth say, Come! And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. But notice the start of that. It says, the Spirit and the Bride say come. Who is that? That's the church with the anointing power of the Holy Spirit saying come. And then he doesn't just want you to walk on and go, you know what, I think I'm going to take of the water of life. He says, if you'll hear, if you'll hear who you are, and what you've done, and how you measure up to God, See, there's an appointment, isn't there? I'm glad I was appointed to hear who I was one day and got saved. Second of all, there's an empowerment that comes with the appointment. Uh, we've always said that whatever God commands to do, He will empower you to do. Amen? Uh, but thinking about salvation, how is this appointment made? How, how is this affected? Well, John 6, the Bible says that no man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I'll raise him up the last day. In other words, salvation is of the Lord. In John 1, 12, it says, To them gave he power uh, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when it comes to salvation, it's not just a mere belief, you know, I've heard the principles and, and I think I'm going to agree and the Christian life seems to be better and more uh, fitting to the Western world and blah, 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 blah. No. Salvation is a miracle where God calls you. He appoints you to salvation. And then He gives you the power to believe. He gives you the power to repent. Amen. He does it all. He breaks your heart. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. That's a fact. Amen? So, do you see with salvation what happened? There was an appointment with the Word of God. You can see it and go, Oh boy, this applies to me. And then there's a power <laughs> that, that leads you not only to that salvation, but if you'll hear, it enables you to walk with God. Amen? But then every calling, and certainly salvation is the same way, it starts with an appointment, it, it is completed with, with empowerment, but it also provokes a profound desire for obedience. It provokes obedience to the Word of God. In Acts 16.30, after that jailer had beat them, he listened to them, sing them hymns, he saw their joy with their raw backs sitting in their own sewage tied down and they're praising Jesus. And at midnight there was an earthquake. Don't you know as they were praising Jesus and testifying and preaching, that old jailer was sitting back there and he was listening. He had an appointment with God. God brought him to the place where he heard the word. God was empowering him. He broke his heart. And then finally he had to come in there with his obedience, his desire for obedience. He says, what must I do to be saved? Amen. You see it happening? Provokes a desire for obedience. Same way with holiness. The same way with the call to suffering. The same way with the call to service. There's an appointment. There's a power. And there's obedience. So, how can a man know he's being called to preach? I'm going to use those three things, but I must begin with two certifiable facts. Number one, he must be qualified. He must be qualified. Now, if you are the father of a young man in this church, please understand your son has the potential of being called to God. So don't mess him up. 
Amen. Don't let him go off to the movies and dating and all that kind of garbage. Teach him the Word of God so that he won't disqualify himself. Amen. Um, anyway, so you must be qualified and it must be based on the truth by Scripture. Amen. But then not only is there a, a qualification, there's a quantification. And you say, I've never understood the difference in those two. Hey, y'all, come on in. It is so good to see you. Y'all must be the flowers. Oh, well, hi, Mom. Good to see you. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, there's so many people that said they were coming today. Yeah, and I am just confused. But it's so good to have you. We're talking about... Oh, amen. It's good to have you. Uh, we're talking about the call to preach. How can someone know they're called to preach? Uh, and we're in Ephesians chapter 4. But not only does a man, before he's ever called, it's a certifiable fact, he has to be qualified. The second thing is he has to be quantified. Now, what's the difference in qualified and, and quantified? Well, when something is qualified, it shows quality. But when something is quantified, all that is is an expression or verification of that quality. So what I'm trying to tell you is, when a man says he's called, the qualification comes from the Word of God. He must be able to show why he's called in the Word of God. He must be qualified based on the Word of God. But then he must be quantified through the church. You know, why are we taught? So we can understand things. Listen, when I first got saved, I was ready to charge hell with a squirt gun, man. That didn't mean I was called, did it? And what I needed was a pastor and other men to say, hey, listen, Sam, you're not, you know, if, if I'm not called, they need to show that. And you say, well, how can you know that? Don't ever get on another man's calling. Then the New Testament means absolutely nothing. He's got to be verified through the church. You know how many preachers, they, don't, they feel they don't get to preach enough or the pastor doesn't acknowledge them enough or whatever, and they'll leave. I'm going to go out and start my own thing. I hate to tell you, buddy, you're not qualified to do that, let alone quantified. Amen? So that's a certifiable fact. Without that, how in the world can we tell if somebody's supposed to have hands laid on them or not? Amen? All right, so as we said, every call in the Bible, whether it's the call to salvation, the call to holiness, the call to service, the call to suffering, or the call to preach is done by appointment, it has an empowerment, and it brings obedience. Amen? So let's talk about the appointment just a little bit. The appointment for a preacher is a scriptural appointment. It is not an ominous appointment. It's not mysterious. It's not something that just poof. Okay? It's obvious. I guarantee you, if God calls some men through this assembly, the preacher's going to know it. The men are going to know it. The Holy Ghost is going to tell us. And you say, how do you, well, isn't that mysterious, Brother Sam? No, that is scriptural. When we are scriptural in those we choose to lay hands on, the Bible says lay hands on no man suddenly, neither be partaker of other men's sins. What's that mean to lay hands on somebody suddenly? It means an unqualified, not quantified person, doesn't it? So the appointment has to be scriptural. It can't be a feeling. You know how many preachers have quit because mama pushed them to preach? Because of a feeling, because of an emotion? I'm going to tell you, I, I fell victim to that. In, in Germany, they had a camp meeting, and come to find out the whole focus of that camp meeting was to get men to surrender, quote, to go to Bulgaria. Now, by then, I'd been saved and called to preach for about a year, and I was doing preaching, man. Uh, you'll see when we talk about obedience in a minute. I wasn't just sitting around, Pastor, when do I get to preach? No, man, I couldn't help it. I had to go out and tell people. And if it was a Mexican, I'd say, hey, somebody speak Spanish? I mean, we had to tell somebody. 
We tried to start works everywhere. We'd bring our own piano. If we didn't have a piano, we'd record it on cassette, bring the song books, bring a bunch of New Testaments, have some people sitting out there on the log be raining, and start telling them about Jesus and teach them how to sing hymns. Amen? Because it was an appointment. But then we get to this meeting, and uh, it's all about calling men to Bulgaria. And so every sermon hit Bulgaria, 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 Bulgaria. And I really felt then, I thought, well, you know, Lord, I, I'll go. Amen, I'll go to Bulgaria. And you know, when you're called to preach and you're trying to, at that time I was in Bible college and I was in the military and all these things, you're, you're trying to find what God wants you to do. I mean, you're just, ah. Oh. But you know what? That day in Bulgaria was not an appointment because we took the trip, the 39-hour by vehicle trip to Bulgaria and realized very quickly, I'm not called here. It, it's like God just slammed a door right in my face and I had to go right through the hard time to figure it out. See, but there's a lot of men that were called from that meeting that actually went and guess how many of them are in Bulgaria today? I'll give you a big, fat, juicy guess. One. Zero? Now, y'all don't be judgmental. You're right. One of them's blown his brains out. That don't sound like a call to the ministry, does it? Anyway, <clears throat> there's an appointment. Like when I got, uh, li like the apostles in John 6, 70, Jesus answered, have not I chosen you 12? One of you is a devil. He said, I chose you even though you're a stinking devil. I chose you to be my apostle. Once you get saved, you'd be a better apostle. Hey, Amen. <laughs> um, it's an appointment. For the prophets in Luke 10, 1, it says, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. He appointed them. And through the church, we appoint pastors and evangelists. We appoint them. Why do we appoint them? Because the Holy Ghost of God has given them the gift. You understand? That's, we don't say, oh, you know what? Uh, uh, you know, I'm glad to have a younger guy here and helping out with things the way he does and, and his wife and how they're, they're so involved with our ministries. And I'm looking forward to having more folks and so on. But um, we're not going to try to force him in the ministry. We're not going to try him or anybody else. I'm not going to go, when are you going to give up and answer the call? I'm not the caller. Amen? The Holy Ghost is through his church. It's an appointment. Amen? You have to be able to say that. It's an appointment. Qualified and quantified appointment in the church called evangelists when he said, Separate me, Paul, uh, Barnabas, and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. You know, that church at Antioch knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Barnabas and Saul were called. There was no, Well, I'm not sure. I, I hope he is. That's not how it went. Amen. All right. Uh, I'm going to move on. I got a whole lot more here, but I'm going to move on because of my own rabbit chasing. So, uh, are we helping you so far? Amen. I think everybody should hear this. Not just the men, not, not just uh, guys that have a, a bent towards uh, public speaking and Bible college. I think we all should hear the truth for the edification of the body. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you what, uh, when we lay hands on somebody, us men, we put hands on somebody and send them out to preach or to say that they can be a, uh, a, a licensed preacher in this assembly. Ho, oh, whatsoever you bind on heaven in earth shall be bound in heaven. God will hold us accountable for that. So we better not go half stepping and, and uh, lay hands on some guy that his wife's halfway beating him up the rest of the week. Amen. Or, or he doesn't read his Bible and he's, or he's a fake. Amen. Um, I didn't mean to say fake right as I looked at you, brother. I, I try to not put emphasis on words while I look at people. I, I don't mean that in any way, just so you know. All right, so there's an appointment. Amen. Do you all see what I'm saying? It's real. It's of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit based on the Word of God in the church. It's an appointment. The second thing is there's an empowerment. The Bible says in Ephesians 3, 7, uh, Wherefore I was made a minister. Did you hear, did you hear the apostle? He didn't say, I became a minister. He said, I was made a minister. I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working 
of His power. Paul says, I was made a minister. I wasn't looking to be a minister. I was made. I was appointed. And then God's Spirit gave me everything I need to be that minister. Amen? Um, and you say, well, how did he get this gift? Well, uh, have you heard the term from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2? Have you heard the term apt to teach? Now, here's my question. A guy that's supposed to be your pastor has to be apt to teach. Now, that doesn't mean he can't stutter or things like that because y'all know. I know y'all go home and say, did you hear Brother Sam mess that up today? I know because Dixie Love here hears it and she tells me every day. Amen. And I try so hard, but it doesn't matter. But thank God it's of the Holy Spirit. It's not of Sam Morris. Amen. Because it is Sam Morris. It have failed. I should have been dead long ago. But it's the being apt is an aptitude for teaching. So we don't go out and find some guy at the college and say, boy, he can really teach. He would be a blessing to our Sunday school. We don't do that. No, what we do is, is we see a guy that's called, we see a guy that's appointed and who is apt to teach from the Holy Ghost. You wouldn't believe the fellows I've seen that are apt to teach. I've seen some preachers, man, they look like the simplest, dumbest guys you ever met in your life. And when they get up to preach, they give you one verse and give you more doctrine out of that verse than you ever dreamed in 30 minutes and have you sitting on the edge of hell and thanking God you're saved. That's the kind of preaching we need. That's being apt to teach. Amen? It's an empowerment, isn't it? See, when you get saved, God empowers you to live for Christ. When you get called, God empowers you to preach the gospel. Amen? Um, oh, finally, let me, let me close with this. There's a desire for obedience. Now, we know in 1 Timothy 3, 1, it says, this is a true saying, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Where does that desire come from? See, we have to ask ourselves that. Because... There are plenty of young men that like how the preacher can preach and people do what he says. Thank God there are a few that do that. <laughs> Amen. And not because the preacher is your Lord, but because the Word of God is preached with the anointing of the Spirit and we obey. Amen. And some of these young preachers are kind of like, uh, was it Simon out there in uh, Samaria? They says, whoa, I want this gift of the Holy Ghost. I want to be able to and zap people when I want. And they'll go out and get them the right suit and they'll get the spit shine wing tips and uh, put Vaseline on their teeth and all these things they do. you got to get the haircut just right and you got to have the starch. And I've been through all that, by the way, and it's garbage. But their desire basically is for them to please themselves. I, I don't remember it, but my mom has always told me about a young man that got up to preach, a preacher boy, and he was all ready and had a brand new Bible, brand new suit, brand new haircut, everything ready to go, and he got up there all prideful. And when he started to preach, he had nothing, absolutely nothing. It, was, it went in three or four minutes and nothing. And he realized he had failed utterly. So what did he do? He closed up his Bible and he went down with his head down in shame and went and sat down. And his pastor got up and said, Son, if you had come up here the way you went down, you would have went down the way you came up. See, the guy's desire was wrong. I'm not talking about just a basic desire. You know, I'd like to be the bishop of an assembly. I'm going to tell you this. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. Well, I kind of like not having to work. And <laughs> Okay. All right. What do you do, Brother Sam? You study all day and you get to get up and preach and tell people what to do. That's right. Give it a try. Give it a try. Go for it. Because I'm telling you what, if you ain't called, you're either going to end up in a ministry of the flesh or you're going to quit. And you're going to run off like a scalded dog. Because the, the desire, the longing does not come from within. It comes from God. I'm going to tell you right now, I'd have quit if it had been up to me a few times. 
By the way, it's a humble calling. Look with me real quick. Uh, jump back to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1. And let's begin. I, I was going to read back in verse 23, uh, talking about the calling and so on, but, but, but let's just go to 26. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now when Sam Morris reads that, what should that say about me? That I am not a wise man after the flesh. And if I am, I'm one of the few. Well, I submit to you I'm not. That I'm not mighty. That I'm not noble. Matter of fact, most people can't stand my preaching because it seems ignoble to them. They don't like somebody telling them exactly how it is uh, because the next thing they want to do is go, well, what are your degrees and uh, how long have you done this and uh, where did you go to cemetery and, I mean, seminary and all that stuff, right? Watch this, verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. What does that say about me? You would be foolish to have a guy like me to be the leading teacher of your assembly. If you were at a lodge or wherever, a school, because I'm foolish. But you tell me, does not our preaching here confound the wise? I sat down with a man that had more doctorates, you know, than, I, than I've had addresses growing up. And I went to Hebrews chapter 6 and started showing him what the principles of the gospel were, and he was tongue-tied. He says, that's not what I've taught. That's not what I have. I may not be saved. And I said, well, brother, that may be right. Confounded him. Of course, he turned his back and never came back. Look what he says. This, this, if you're called, this is what you are. Okay, I'm just telling you. Uh, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. You know what? The first thing you need to realize, if you're not despised, if you're not humble in this calling, I want to tell you something. You're not called. But if you're trying to go, well, you know what? I'd like to do that. I'd like to be in the ministry. That, that's a pretty good way to make a living. Man, you are dumb as a box of rocks. At least you qualify in that part. Amen? Uh, but let me tell you something about this. See, God knows what he's doing. God knew way before he created anything, there'd be a man named Sam Morris preaching at Old Paz Baptist Church in Fayetteville, Tennessee. I never had aspirations. I don't know anybody who has aspirations to go to Fayetteville, Tennessee. I never dreamed after 20 years I'd be in a little same little small tin building with still just a few people. I, I never dreamed that. But God had it planned. God worked it out. Somebody needed to hear the gospel and God's going to use me to give it to you. Not only is it a desire, it is an overwhelming desire. 1 Corinthians 9.16 says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He says, you might, woe, you, curse me if I can't preach the gospel. And if a young man doesn't have this, he doesn't have, if you're called, there's an appointment. You can see it in the Word of God. The church can see it. There's an appointment. There's, there's an obvious empowerment. You have the ability from the Holy Ghost to do it. Uh, you don't have to have the education. Just have the education of Neology 101. Amen? Just get into your scriptures. Get on your knees. Let God lead you. He knows what He's doing. But then there's going to be this desire. And if a man is, is, is called to preach, he can't stop preaching. He is not happy sitting once every three months when the pastor lets him preach on a Wednesday night or something. He's not happy with that. He has to preach. He has to preach to someone Somehow, he has to witness to somebody. Amen? I'm just going to tell you that's what it is. And if a guy doesn't have that, if he kind of settles back on his leaves, and yeah, I'm a preacher boy, and I'm going to college, and yeah, I got problems with that. 
I, hey, the only judge I have on this is me. I know what I did when I was called to preach. Baby, do you remember what I did when I was called to preach? I went everywhere to preach. Of course, I was so dumb. Uh, I'd go anywhere to preach. Uh, some places you ought not go to preach, I'm just going to tell you. And I did anyhow. Uh, didn't know I was dumb, man, but every rescue mission, every every time I got a chance, every post in Germany between me and an hour and a half out, I tried to find, hey, y'all have a church service on Sunday? Well, why not? You can't make it out here? Good, we'll come to you. And we'll load it up and we'll come. We'll set up chairs. One guy show up. Praise God, we'll preach to that guy just like there's a thousand there. Right? That's what preaching is. It's a call that is appointed that is equipped or empowered, and it is an overwhelming desire to obey God. If a man doesn't have that, it's not called. It's not called. Amen? Well, I hope you learned something this morning. God is blessing.